Well, today we're going to talk about both bone fractures in the pediatric age group. Is that right? Yes, sir. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really forearm fractures, and we'll talk about why you shouldn't say both bone in a few minutes. Forearm fractures, is that right? Mm. Yes. No, because you really haven't broken the arteries and the nerves and so forth. You've, it's mainly, the proper term is what? Mid-shaft radius and ulna fracture. That's right. Diaphy you can say diaphyseal or fractures of the radius and ulna. And it's different because it's a different kind of bone. Remember when we discussed in the first session when we talked about diaphyseal bone, it, it's mature, doesn't have as much remodeling capacity. So it's best to call it fractures, be very specific, fractures of the shaft and the radius and ulna. And also, as we'll see, it has different problems as far as muscle activity is concerned. Now, let's look at the incidence, and we'll talk about the incidence versus the age group and the anatomical location. And we're going to talk just strictly about fractures in the diaphyseal area. Now, at what ages do you see diaphyseal fractures in children, in the males? Between seven and... Yeah, it's a bimodal pattern. You see it early, when they're about nine to ten years of age, when they're out playing on the, on the um, uh, slides and swings and so forth. And then you see it later when they're out doing athletics at about 14, 15 years of age. Now in the bimodal pattern. Females really, and this may change in the future, this was uh, Landon's, Leonard Landon's classic uh, monograph when he looked at all the different incidents of fractures in Sweden in 19, 83, but you might see a little difference here. Why do you think in females? Why because they're getting more active? Yeah, right there. Well, they're actually now more females are participating in sports. Okay, so it's a, and it's just a single pattern function. Now, where do they mostly occur in the radius? Where, where do you see most radius fractures in, your, in the emergency room? In the diaphysis? That's right. Well, no, we're not in the diaphysis. Oh, we're the talking about the whole radius. The metaphysis. Metaphysis, that's right. About 52% occur in the diaphysis, in the metaphysis, rather. And then you add on here the distal physis. So that means that 70% of our fractures that you see in children are going to occur either in the metaphysis or the di uh, physis. And proximal, how often do you see fractures in children? Not, not as often. No, it's pretty rare, really. Um, about 6%. It's pretty rare to see proximal fractures, and we'll have a whole discussion on that. So that leaves us the shaft. So only about 25% here, the message here is only about 25% of the fractures involving the radius and ulna occur in the shaft. And that's because it's diaphyseal bone and it's a little bit stronger and resists some of the tension forces. Okay, now where in the shaft do the fractures occur? How about proximal? About 9%. We get in the middle, it's about 30%. And it's in the distal, it's about 57%. So what's the message here? The more distal is where most yeah. of our actions. Yeah, the more distal is more. And why is that? Um, it's, that's when you're getting towards the metaphysis. That's so right, and metaphysis. it's a little bit more immature bone. There's also a graduation by age. The, the average age here is about six years, and it's really not until a little bit older, about 9.8 years. Now, why do they occur most commonly distally? There's three reasons. Well, one, it's weaker bone. It's, uh, it's a little bit more. It's still somewhat semi-metaphyseal. Secondly, there's not much muscle coverage to protect it distally. And third, it's a longer lever arm. That's why you learn physics. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy. Is it important in the anatomy? Yes, sir. Why is that? Oh, it, it determines how the fracture will displace. That's right. Very good. It, it's the muscle forces. Once you release the integrity of the diaphysis, then the muscles have a tendency to uh, displace the fragments. So let's look at some of the bony anatomic relationships. On the anterior, if you posterior radiographs, if a projection, 
what is the relationship of the bicycle to tuberosity to yeah, the radio styline. What's should the be radio? 180 degrees. That's your right. It should be. They should both be in full profile. Okay, so there should be 180 degrees of rotation. That's a good way to tell your rotation. You don't look at this very often, but in the ulna, in the sagittal plane, what's the relationship of the coronoid process? What's the other part that you look at? Ulnar styloid. Ulnar styloid. That's right relationship to the owner's styloid in the sagittal plane, again, that's 180 degrees. And you really don't s see that. Uh, I mean, you really don't look at that very often. You really, really more focus on the radius. Now, if you have a fracture of the proximal fragments, what are the muscle forces that are making that fragment angulate? Uh, you have the, um, the biceps, yes. which cause it to flex, and then you have your supinator, which That's is right. Both of those, biceps and supinator, and what do they do to that proximal fragment? Uh, flex it and supinate. Yeah, well, they flex it and supinate and externally rotate it. What's on that distal fragment? Uh, the uh, brachioradialis and the pronator. And the pronator, right. The pronator, mainly the pronator teres. So you have a rotational malalignment here when you break the integrity of the proximal radius right here. So you have to consider that when you're doing the uh, reduction maneuvers that we'll discuss. So these are these are especially active if the ulna is intact. Now we go to the distal one, what are the muscle forces that are occurring um, here? Brachial radialis and the uh, uh, pronator quadratus. That's right. The pronator quadratus brings it into this kind of flexion and then the rotation is because the brachioradialis attaches to the uh, distal radius. So both of those muscles cause this thing to angulate. And again, it's really uh, a problem if the ulna is intact and you can't control it. So brachioradialis and forearm flexures and the pronator quadratus. So again, if it's the ulna is intact, that makes it difficult. It makes it difficult to manipulate and it makes the muscle forces more uh, accentuated. So, here we have a resident. He's on call, and he calls the staff, Dr. Jones, from the pediatric ER, and he says, Dr. Jones, I have a seven-year-old female with both bones of the fracture of her left forearm. There it is. That's both the radius and ulna, so that's two bones. But Dr. Jones is not very happy he says, all right, you stupid resident. You've told me nothing that tells me how to treat this unfortunate patient. So you're gonna to have to go and be a little bit more descriptive because it, and as we'll see, he can describe the pathology in just a few words. So both bones, what do you mean? Is it the ulnar styloid and the radial neck? You're wasting my time. Now give me some information about how this fracture is classified so we can determine the treatment. Well, it looks like he needs to study a little bit more. That's right. And fortunately, you folks have all studied, and you'll understand this. So, ideally, what sort of classification tell you? How to treat it. Well, that's right. It, well, it tells you the structural pattern of the fracture. And it also tells you how to treat it. It tells you the treatment options that are available. And the other thing, the f other thing that can occur it can give you prognostic information? Yeah, or the possible complications that can occur, the things that you look for. So, if you're in the emergency room and you see a fracture uh, of the radius and on the shafts and you're gonna call your staff person, what's the minimum information that you need to provide that individual, your staff person? Um, the direction of the uh proximal and distal fragments? Um, yeah, the location of the fracture. Is it distal, middle, or proximal thirds? Secondly, the degree of completeness of the fracture. And thirdly, the direction, as you said, of the resultant deformity. So, this is a classification method that's produced by uh, Drs. Price and Mencinio that have worked together to include these elements. So. We'll go ahead and go through that. We took at the fracture level, 
And if you look, it's in the thirds, the proximal third. Again, you have this one that's involved by the supinator and the biceps and have this type of deformity that you have to deal with, plus rotation. If it's in the middle, it's really usually just a transverse fracture, and you have mostly dealing with shortening. And if it's in the distal one, as we talked, you'll have angulation like this that can occur. So, what difference does this make? Well, the fracture level may have some effect on the muscle forces, as we talked, acting on the fragments. And which ones are most affected by muscle activity? We just went through that. It's the proximal one, the proximal one-third fractures, because the muscle is attached to that proximal one-third. And here again, we go through this. It causes external rotation, the biceps, and the supinator combined. And the, this one causes it to pronate just a little bit. So you have a lot of rotational components that you have to deal with in the proximal fragment. So it may be difficult to control that. You have no way of really putting a mold or anything on that proximal fragment. That's what we call the king fragment. So you have to take the distal fragment and bring it to the proximal fragment. Now, we talked about the different degrees of how bone fails. That's why we had that first lecture so what is the different degrees of completeness or fracture that you see? Um, First thing that can occur. Well, is elastic deformation? Yeah, right. It's really elastic, and then that's followed Plast by plastic yes, deformation. And now, the, and the completeness of the ulna is uh, plastic deformation. What's the next, what's, the, what's, what's this one here? Partial or green stick? Yeah, that's a green stick fracture. Yeah, it's just partial. And finally, if you have enough force, what's the degree of completeness we have here? Uh, it's complete. complete. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Both of them are complete. You can have one complete, a complete fracture. So you have to take that into in the discussion. What's the completeness plus what is the deformity that the patient has and where it is in the, the shaft? Okay, now, we, we like to do classifications. And remember, what are classifications of shaft, green stick shaft fractures. There's two good classifications that you need to be aware of. What are they? Tension and compression? Well, yeah, in some respects, they're all tension. They all fail in tension. It's the direction of the deformity. So they're components of the direction of the deformity. It's what is the angulation, and the other is what? Rotation. What are Rotation, very good, yeah. And it's what... It, kind of rotation that you have. So, as we talk about green stick classification, what's the most common direction of the deformity? Apex volar? Yeah, but you have supination plus apex volar, so it's a combination of rotation plus angulation. So there's two deformities that you have to deal with when you're dealing with this, apex volar. Now, the less common direction of the deformity is what? Apex dorsal and pronation. Very good. Apex dorsal and pronation. Pronation and it's apex dorsal. Uh, here again, you have two components that you have to deal with. You have to deal with uh, rotational component and angular deformity. Now, here we go. I got a resident has read this time. He went home and read, and so he calls Dr. Jones, and he says, Dr. Jones, I have a mid-shaft supination rotation apex volar green stick fractures involving both the radius and ulna. And with that description, immediately he tells him all the information that Dr. Jones says. And Dr. Jones says, great work. You're no longer stupid. <laughs> you have given me a clear picture of the type of fracture we're dealing with. So based on the information you give me, I think we can easily manage this with a closed reduction in cast. So that's why you need to be a little bit more precise. That's why classifications are important. They are a little bit more precise and will give you the information that you need as we discussed. The structure, the treatment, and the possible complications. And it sure pays to have read about it. So we'll look at the biomechanical characteristics of each type. And they're dependent upon really the completeness of the fracture process. So what do we have here? Um, it's bent, 
Yes, sir. With plastic deformation, you That's have right. a failure of the uh, internal structure. Yes, yeah, but so it is a fracture, but it's a fracture of the bone units internally, but the cortex remains intact. So what is it? This one has a radius green stick fracture, but here we have plastic deformation. We don't have cortical disruption and obvious fracture seen. And often, unfortunately, in the emergency room and so forth, this is not appreciated. So the green stick fracture will draw, and this one draws attention to the plastically deformed ulna. Now, if both of them are plastically deformed, the diagnosis may not be obvious. This patient lost rotation and had pain in the forearm, but the emergency room doctor says, I don't think it's fractured. But you can see that there is plastic deformation, and the other key that you have problem is what? Uh, pronation. Yeah, loss of rotation. Yeah, so it's a rotational malalignment when you get plastic deformation. Okay, so both the radius and ulna are plastically deformed. Now, when does plastic deformation occur? Well, we went through this before. The first thing that happens is that you have elastic deformation, and then you start to have enough force that it starts to alter the internal structure, and it begins to fatigue, and then it overloads and actually changes that internal structure, and you alter the internal structure. And the next zone is if you really have a lot of force, it'll completely fail. And so plastic deformation usually occurs in this area. When the load is greater than the elastic limit, but it's not quite at the fracture point. Okay, so, and the other thing it's really important to remember, even though you don't see break in the cortex, you have a deformity, and it's an internal deformity, and if you don't correct it, it's gonna be a permanent deformity unless it's corrected. That's very important, that even though you don't see an obvious break in the cortex, you have a deformity and it's got to be corrected. So, the, what's the big thing in the clinical appearance? What do you see? Um, usually loss of motion, pronation, right. supination. Yeah, well look, it's crooked. Uh, okay. But is it broken? And so, it's not especially painful because the cortex has not been broken, so you don't have the, what you see when the cortex breaks, what do you get in the soft tissues? Bleeding. And so you get bleeding and uh, hemorrhage and pain from the bleeding. So what you need to do is you usually make a comparison with the affected side, and you can see this has uh, a rot a, both a rotational component and an angular deformity when you compare it with the straight. It should be straight. And it helps out to bring the real deformity. Now the pathology involved is that the changes are microscopic, the cement lines slip, the osteon fragments have displaced here, and you see the cement lines just uh, slipping here, and so there'll be some changes. You're not gonna do this, you're not gonna biopsy the bone, but this is what happened in the studies here but that have been done before. Now, the functional effects are what? They lose their rotation. That's right. And here's a boy that has it, that same patient. And see that he's got loss of forearm rotation, loss of supination, and loss of pronation. Now the green stick fractures, the biomechanical characteristics of pediatric bone, it has a lower modulus of elasticity, has a lower bending strength, it's easier to bend it. It has lower ash content, doesn't have as much calcium, or not calcium, but um, osseous tissue replied, and this is a study a long time ago by Curry and Butler. And because of these difficulties, the failure of pediatric bone differs than that in the adults. What do you see here? What kind of, if you describe this? Uh, distal third, green stick fractures of both the radius and ulna. Yeah, and you don't have two views, so you can't tell the rotational component. But that tells me a lot, that it's a distal fracture and it's a, an incomplete fracture, so if it's incomplete, it's still length stable. The the cortex is intact. So you have here, what happens in the, in the bending force, some of the injury is absorbed in the both elastic and plastic deformation that occurs in the bone, 
And so you've lost some of the initial injury in that early def deformation. So the fracture occurs only partially. You haven't got enough force to complete the fracture, as you can see here. So this first fracture surface is smooth and it's returned as our so-called fast crack. Now the, the other part, the other cortex on the concave side is intact on the compressive side. And it, it, it's still intact because you've lost the energy from the elastic and plastic deformation. And that's the slowing of it. And it's macroscopically here. What you'll see in a fracture, you'll see these little bone unit cells. Remember the osteocytes are covered by osseous tissue and they're called osteons, and then they're cement lines that hold it together. So this again was the work by Carey and Butler. So the tension side fails and is disrupted, and so the compression side remains partially intact and plastically deformed. Now, what's the, what about the bio, what about the biomechanical characteristics of a complete fracture? What do you have to deal with here? Loss of length. That's right, shortening. It's length instable. The others are length stable, plastic deformation and green stick fracture. So you don't have to deal with length. You don't have to reestablish length. So it's almost no intrinsic stability to linear or rotational or length alignment. So it's, if it's complete, you have a lot more problems that you have to deal with. And the muscle forces are more of a deforming force. They're causing shortening. And they also, depends on where it is, they can cause angulation. And usually, because it has greater force, you have more soft tissue injury to deal with. Okay, the treatment. So, how do we classify the degrees of completeness? How does that dictate the management of the fracture? And again, what are the three types of completeness? Plastic deformation. How are these best treated? Uh through a um, steady pressure through a fulcrum? That's right. You, you have to realign the internal structure, and that usually requires this technique. And this technique actually was devised and, and published by one of our former residents about 20 years ago. But you put a gradual, constant pressure over a fulcrum, and with that, that you will improve that. Now, the important thing is, this is by Dr. Sanders and Heckman here, uh, 1984. So, you'll get a reduction, but it's never just exactly uh, anatomic. But what's the clue that you've got a satisfactory alignment and reduction? How do you examine the patient? What do you look for? Well, if the anatomic is not completely achieved, but you've got satisfactory restruction, res, res restoration of the rot supination rotation. That's the important thing that you need to do, that you've really reestablished that. And once you've got that, even though it's still a little bit crooked, that's, that's what the patient's going to complain about. Because on this view here, this patient's not going to have much of a cosmetic difficulty but you do want to reestablish the rotational component. So how long do you immobilize them? Six weeks. Yeah, about six weeks, because it's still fractured, it's, but it's internal derangement. It's still, and, so you, and you also need to take radiographs in the first two weeks just to make sure there's no recurrence, because it's a little bit difficult to put you know, uh, compressive forces on that. Now, <clears throat> The basic principles to consider in green stick fractures, what, what do you need to consider there? Well, there's usually internal stability from the intact cortex. So length is maintained, you don't have to worry about that. But remember, it's got both, what, what two are the two major components of green stick fractures? The, uh, Rotation and angulation, angulation. that's right. Now, there's always this controversy, should the fracture be completed with a green stick fracture? And when, when, what happens when you reduce it? Is it fracture? Yeah, it, 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 it completes it. 
Yeah, you feel it, you hear it crack. And the parent, if the parent's there, they kind of wince a little bit. And you hear it crack. So often, it's not a factor because once you reduce it, usually you complete the fracture. And the fracture on the intact side is usually completed. Now, some people will go to a lot of great lengths to complete that. And the arguments pro are, it prevents, gives you a little bit ch less chance of getting recurrent deformities. Because if you got plastic deformation on one cortex, it has a tendency to recur a little bit. Secondly, the fractures that, that, that fail the most, or that fail are most predisposed to fail, are green stick fractures because they have incomplete callus. They have callus only on the fractured side, only on the tension side. So if you've completed, then you have a lot more callus, and so you have less chance of refracture. The argument against it is what happened? It caused a hematoma and probably yeah. worried about compartments. You may destabilize it. When you go to a complete fracture, then you may lose your length stability, and so you may have more problems. But the best thing to do is correct it and usually try to maintain it. Don't overcorrect it and don't be too aggressive. So, again, we talk about our rotation, angulation, cor correlations. If it's supinated, what's the other th thing you have to deal with? The rotation. And how is it? It's already supinated rotation. What else is it? Apex volar. That's exactly right. It's apex volar. That's right. Now, just the opposite. If it's in pronation, what is it? Apex dorsal. That's very good. Yes, apex dorsal. Those are the two things that you see here. Now, let's look at this fracture. The distal fragment is supinated, and it's got an apex anterior. So, how are you going to... what? two manipulations, or what two things do you need to do to correct this one? Is this a green stick fracture? Yes. Looks like it. Yes, sir. Yeah, it involves only the radius. And remember, look at here, this is angulated a little bit towards the ulnar side, and that's because of the uh, supinator and the biceps, or angulate that. And so, <clears throat> you have to to correct that, what's going to be your motion? A, a dorsal and uh, pronated force to yeah, reverse Yeah, really. That. A lot of times, if you correct the rotation, the angular deformity will spontaneously correct. And that's all that was needed in this one. They've just pronated it, and that corrected the angular deformity, as you can see here. Now, what about this one? You're, this is your favorite. You just told me it was apex dorsal, and it's pronated. So how are you going to reduce this one? We should supinate that? That's exactly right. You need to evaluate the type of fracture pattern. And you told me this was apex dorsal uh, pronation fracture pattern. And so best type of manipulate it. And you told me as to what? To supinate? That's exactly right. And you, for you my manipulate it into supination. And here you immobilize them in long arm cast in supination and see you fully have corrected both the rotation and the angular deformities. So that's important. Now, years ago I was taught <coughs> that distal radius you put in pronation, mid-shaft, the, the rule was mid distal fracture pronation, mid-shaft, neutral, and proximal radius fracture supination. That was kind of the old standard standby that we were taught, and it was in the textbooks and so forth. So this patient comes in and fell from the swing. It was done by a person that trained years ago. And here it's supination, apex volar. And this person didn't quite follow those rules. And he, the primary treatment was a long arm cast with the elbow in 90 degrees of flexion, but the forearm was in neutral. So. You got to predict what may happen? It didn't heal correctly? Well, it hasn't. It came in at two weeks, and what's happened here? You've lost the reduction. And so what's transpired is that it, if you put it in a, it's a child that's a little bit overweight in short forearm, you put it in this, this one here, a long arm cast, 
they have a tendency to sneak up in there, and so it's slipped proximally. Is that 20 degrees? Is that acceptable angulation? No, it's not. And they say, this is, I forget how, this is uh, a younger child here. And so the distal fragment is still in some supination. So, and it's, it's slipped up into the cast, causing the angulation. So what do you, what, you take this x-ray, and what's your next step? Oh. You're going to look at it. What is it going to look like clinically? Doctor, he's, going, he's got the potential to be good in sports. <laughs> is he going to be okay? Is that going to straighten out? You know, everybody asks, who treated it? Dr. So-and-so. Oh, I thought so. Yes, I've had lots of problems with Dr. So-and-so. So, anyway, what are you going to do here? Uh, you may have to remanipulate it. That's right. You need to, the mom's one happy, so you need to remanipulate it. And you know that if you put it in a long arm cast with the elbow flexed, what happens? It may re-angulate. So, we place it in a long arm cast in extension. And this was popularized by Mercer Rang about 20 years ago. And everybody says, oh, you don't do that. You always have them at 90 degrees. And he had a hard time getting it, um, getting it uh, published. But it's a good mechanism, especially if you've had to re-manipulate it. So here you have it here. And it's still got a little bit of apex volar, but it's within acceptable limits and it's now in pronation. So, the principle is considered a long arm and cast an extension. Here you put in a long arm and cast, you need to put a good superconvert mold, but the real key that keeps it from sliding is that you have to include the thumb. If it doesn't, it'll slide down and start to rub on. And so it's important that you include the thumb and put it in full abduction. And here you pad well over the thinner eminence. Now, so patients 12 years and older don't tolerate this type of cast, and so you may need, as we'll discuss, to consider some other options. Now, how effective? Well, the re-manipulation rate is about 15, 20 percent if you put it in a long arm cast with 90 degrees. We did a study here, and in Dr. Rang's original article, the re-manipulation rate was almost zero. You know, and the ulna has a tendency to kind of drift towards the radius, but that doesn't seem to cause any problems. Usually not a problem with rotation or with the clinical appearance. Now, again, what's this fracture pattern? Uh, green stick, apex volar. Yes, supination, and what else? Apex and yeah, apex volar, supination. So how are you going to treat that one? I will pronate it and uh, put a mold on the, on the apex. Yes, right. So I use supination, apex volar, should be manipulated and mobilized. Again, this was treated by an older orthopedic surgeon, and he put him in some supination. Didn't correct that, did they? Actually, probably made it worse. And so they put him in supination. That seemed to be the thing to do because it was already kind of supinated. And the angulation is probably acceptable, but your assessment is that it was placed in supination. So what's going to happen? It's going to get worse. Well, it may not get worse, but if you leave it at that degree, what's, what's going to happen with the patient's function? Well, here he is. He went on to heal, went on to heal, but he came back at six months and since you put him in supination, he's got full supination, but he can only pronate to 90 degrees. So that can be a little bit of a problem, in, especially nowadays when you do a lot of things with computers and typing and so forth. That we do a lot more activities in pronation. Now, <clears throat> which green stick fracture requires a little bit more exact reduction? The apex dorsal because it's poorly tolerated and you don't have a lot of soft tissue to correct that or to cover it, to hide it. And what other factor can occur when you have an apex dorsal angulation? 
There's very little overlying tissue to hide the angular deformity. <clears throat> and so they also have a tendency to refracture. Now, how late can you obtain a satisfactory correction with a closed reduction alone? Here's a patient that showed up a month post fracture. And here you go, it's in a month post fracture. It had 21 degrees. Is that going to remodel? Remember, diaphyseal bone doesn't remodel much. Okay, and he's already callous, but not quite mature. So, and the radius is angulated as well. Is this acceptable? No. no. So he's, he's already a month. You're going to tell him that it's going to be crooked and you'll have to do big surgery later on, or can you manipulate it? It's worth trying to manipulate it. Yeah, that's right. So how would you describe Well, how about a clinical exam? What's it here? What have we got here? Apex where? Dorsal. Dorsal. And what's the rotation? Pronation. Pronation. That's right. So how are you going to manipulate this one? Reverse the deformity. Yeah, that's right. So he had full pronation, but very little supination. And so that was an apex dorsal pronation. So now we've established a fracture pattern. And so how are you going to manipulate it? Uh, we're going to supinate it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So you force it into supination, and that corrects a lot of the deformity in itself. And the angular, the, with that, the ulnar angulation has involved. Since these are slow to heal, you can probably do it as, I've been able to do some of them as late as six weeks. After six weeks, you're not going to be able to do it. You'll probably have to do some kind of osteotomy at after about six weeks. So here he is, and he's now in supination, and so confirms the sagittal plane correction. And here he is again. And the coronal plane, while not perfect, the supination has been reestablished, and that's within the limits of remodeling. And so we put this patient in a long arm cast in extension in supination. Okay, and the forearm was forced into supination. And included, the, you can see we included the thumb and then split the cast and closed it later on. So now what about complete fractures? Remember, you don't have much in the way of intrinsic stability to any of the uh, deformities, linear, rotational, or length. The muscle forces are more of a deforming force uh, because you have no in integrity and you have greater soft tissue injury. So there may be a problem. Here's a patient I saw in an emergency room. He was an 11-year-old female male, and this was the best I could get, achieve in the emergency room under con no Actually, it was under beer block or regional anesthesia. Is that okay? You shaking your head? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Would you operate on that patient? I try to close reduce it. Well, uh, with under anesthesia. Well, I tried oh. three times. Okay. So that's the best I could do, and so I only got less than ten degrees, and the linear alignment in the sagittal plane and the coronal plane is acceptable. So. Is bayonet eye position acceptable? Well, what do you do next? Well, we wash him, and I know the mother's eyes all opened up when he came back and said, is he going to be okay? It looks, it looks, still looks crooked, doctor. So I finally hunted him down. He did well. I hunted him down and had him come back five years, and he's got a little bit of angulation, but he had full supination and pronation. So the message is, Bayonet opposition is okay as long as you have the criteria for alignment and rotation that are met. And you have no more than about a centimeter of overlap. But you have to watch it very carefully. You have to correct both of them. Now, this patient came in with this fracture pattern, and this is, how would you describe it to me? I would say it's a mid-shaft complete uh, radius and all that fracture. Yeah, right, that's right. It's 11 years old. So you put it in a cast, and it shows up in the clinic. This is at one week. Still straight, isn't it? It looks straight. I can't tell the rotation, though. Oh, 
rotation. Very good. You're looking past just the angulation. Remember, you got to look at ang angulation and rotation. Now, what's your assessment of the rotation? Well, it seems that the um, tuberosity and the styloid are not at 180 degrees. That's right. Very good. So there's also a difference. Remember the radius is an elliptical bone. It's not a circular bone. And it's elliptical. And so if you have rotation, you'll have difference in the, the diameters, and notice that, which gives you some rotational misalignment. And on the AP, what's happened here? It's supinated. Where is the distal fragment? It's at 90 degrees. So if you leave this patient, he'll lose 90 degrees of pronation because that proximal fragment is supinated. And so you have 90 degrees of rotation. So what's your next step? Uh, you have to re re reduce them. Yeah, and so mainly, what are you reducing? Just the, Just the rotation. So it comes back now. What's your assessment now? say that the rotation's been reestablished. That's right, and so the angular alignment is good. And here you can see the same thing. You've got a little bit of bayonet apposition, but your angulation is at 180 degrees. So you were very smart to be able to look past the angulation, look at the rotation component. You can do that. We had one not too long ago that the resident said, gee, it looks real good. But when you really look at it critically, there was a rotational malalignment, as you can see. Now, really, what you need to do is go back to your original x-rays and what's happened here. Well, if you look at the original x-rays, you had really primary supination of that proximal fragment, and it was pretty well aligned initially, but when they put it into 90 degrees of neutral, you just rotated the distal fragment, and remember, you can't control that proximal fragment. So it had 180 degrees of rotation. So carefully evaluate to see the original position of the fragments. That may give you a clue what you have to do. Remember that proximal fragment is the king fragment, and you have to take the distal fragment and bring it to that. So here you got this patient. It's a kind of a distal middle thirds, and you put it in a cast, how's that look? It's one week. Yeah, it looks pretty good. It's just a little angulated. You don't like it much. It's about 10 degrees. And he's pretty mature, you can see, when you look at the distal radius. So what you can do, you can actually wedge the cast if it's up, up to about a week before you have callus. And you can wedge the cast, and then went on to a good reduction. So it's important to remember uh, wedging process. So when we evaluate our reduction, what's the acceptable limits of angulation and rotation and shortening? Okay, Dr. Price years ago in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics reviewed a lot of fractures and he had some that had been, <clears throat> did not have perfect reductions. And he, what he did was he determined which ones give you sufficient enough that you can get uh, enough uh, remodeling and that you'll get sufficient functional effect. So angulation, at, at less than nine years of age, how much can you accept? 45 degrees? No, it's ang no angulation, oh. that's rotation. Okay. Yeah, that's 15 degrees. Suppose they're a little bit older. 10 degrees? Yeah, that's right, 10 degrees, that's right. So what about rotation? Now you can do it. Age in nine years? 45. Yeah, 45 degrees. And if they're at the next notch, you have to about three degrees of rotation. That will give you a good outcome, functional, and cosmetic outcome. Shortening doesn't seem to be much of a problem. And the other thing that everybody worries about is this fracture in which there is a interosseous impingement. And in his study, he said that was kind of unpredictable indicator, as long as you had corrected the rotation and the angular malalignment. Now, 
You're going into orthopedics because you like to do surgery? Yes, sir. Yeah. So when are you going to get your scalpel out? If they have a compartment syndrome. Well, that's one. You hope, you hope you get that before you get that. But this is primary care before they get complications. Or an ipsilateral. Well, would you agree? Fracture. Yeah. Open fractures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of soft tissue injury, you know. Uh, inability to maintain a closed reduction. And ipsilateral fractures. And this is kind of relative, refractures. We'll discuss this in just a minute. So, here's an open fracture, and this thing, this was sticking out, this little thing had stuck out, and had a little dirt on it, and it was a grade one open fracture. What are you gonna do with this? Um, Go ahead. Oh, you'd wanna wash it, um, to yeah. breathe the edges, and then... Uh, Can you put a real well-molded cast on after you've done all that surgery? Mm, it's hard if you need it. Yeah, it's hard. really hard. Yeah. That's right. So you got contamination. You debride it. So cross pins. Years ago, we did that. Intermediary pins, plates and screws, or an external fixator. I I'd probably go with the the intermediary nails. That's right. Yeah, that's an easy to stabilize it. Intermediary nails. So here's a here's a actually just a three year old. Um, and his forearm was run over by a car, and he was kind of a little bit overweight, and and so he had a lot of swelling, soft tissue swelling. Can you manage this in a cast? No. Probably not. You mean you have a little bit of a problem here because it's such a short arm, and he's got a lot of soft tissue swelling, and so he was managed with intermediary fixation. That's before we had the commercially available intermediary nails, we use K-wires, and they work, still work very well. Now, inability to maintain a closed reduction. Which types of fractures are difficult to maintain by non-operative methods? So with the ulna intact? That's right. Proximal, certainly if the ulna is intact. Notice the ulna is intact, and simply just put a pin down the radius. If it's distal, Again, the ulna is intact. It's hard to you. It's very hard to manipulate that fracture, especially if the ulna is intact. And so you just put a single pin down here. Now, <clears throat> here's had a refracture who sustained a second fracture. Should this be considered for a surgical intervention? Well, he's two months post cast removal, and he had healed his previous fractures, but he refractured. And usually the problem here, he's been in a cast for how long? Eight weeks, four weeks long arm, four weeks short arm cast. So his bone is kind of osteopenic for previous immobilization, and that's one of the reasons he failed easily. So his muscles are kind of atrophic, doesn't have a lot of support if he falls. And <clears throat> Uh, you immobilize them again for another eight weeks, that's just going to accentuate the osteopenia and muscle atrophy. So, usually on these, I have a lower threshold for doing intermediary nail fixation because it allows early motion. You can start early motion and rehabilitate your muscles. And you, the f further deterioration of the bone and muscle may be lessened. And they have it. Refractures also are sometimes are a little hard to manipulate and they have a tendency to have late recurring deformities. Now, ipsilateral fracture. This is a supraconlar fracture and it also had a mid-shaft radius and ulna complete. What are you going to do? How are you going to manipulate that supraconlar fracture? You need to fix the radius first. That's right. You need a lever arm to manipulate that distal fragment so you need to fix that first stabilize that so you'll have a nice long lever arm to do it plus the fact you don't want to put a long i mean a real tight fitting cast on especially if you've got a super condor fracture and so it increases the risk of post-reduction swelling because the knee you don't really need a snug cast now 
What about plate fixation in the pediatric age group? When would you consider plate fixation? Uh, I think it's when they're older and if there's significant soft tissue injury. That's right. This is a 12-year-old, had a crushing injury, and she came in and she started having severe swelling and decreased sensation in her hand. Now, would you treat her with a cast, intermediary nails, or plate? Probably a plate to Why? look at the nerve. Yeah, you can look at the nerve. The decreased sensation was actually due to an impending, thought to be an impending compartment syndrome. So, they had concerns there, and so we use plates, because when you do plates, you do a fasciotomy, essentially. And so plate fixation releases the compartments, which decreases the chance of a compartment syndrome. Plus, you don't have to put them on a, any kind of really much immobilization. The plates are usually stable enough. There's other indications, certainly if it's comminuted or it's an older and larger child. Now, they've done studies in the younger children with plates and IM rods. Which is better? I think the rods are better. The rods are better? Really? Well, both are equal regarding functional recovery, rate of union, and complications. However, you can put the pins in a shorter operative time, you don't have to make as big an incision and less soft tissue dissection to apply both and remove. So the pins are probably <clears throat> a little more advantageous because you can put them in quicker and you don't have to do as much surgical intervention. Overall the results with pins are good in this study. And once they got started doing pins, everybody jumped on that bandwagon and had good treatment. And so, but there may be a learning curve with complications early in their use. And these people had a little bit of trouble with compartment syndrome. What is it that predisposes them to compartment syndrome if you're putting the pins in? If you require a lot of manipulation. That's right, that's right. You, you're manipulation, so what's the rule? No more than three attempts. No more than three attempts or uh, Al Crawford said 17 minutes. After 17 minutes, you better back off. And you can then make a little tiny incision and look at it and send them past by. A lot of times there's interposed tissue, so forth, that makes it difficult. Now, does the insertion of, when I was a resident, we were told you never put metal in open fractures because it increases the infection rate. What do the new studies show? It's not increasing. That's right. Studies have demonstrated that immediate operative stabilization of open fractures in both adults and children does not increase the infection rate as long as you follow the other rules. Good debridement, good irrigation, and you, you know, do secondary closure of your skin. So these are the two studies that have done, shown that. Should metallic implants be removed if they're asymptomatic? Well, here again, the answer is not clear regarding the upper extremity. Some say yes to prevent refracture and long-term exposure. Certainly in the lower extremity, there is a high rate of refracture at the end of the plate because of the stress rate rising. But it doesn't seem to be as much trouble in the upper extremity. And others say no because when you take the plate out, you've got a defect, and so there's a higher rate of associated with implant removal and for refractures. <clears throat> so certainly there's no controversy if the implants are symptomatic. Now there may be some advantages in, in temporarily retaining intermediary implants. Here's a patient, was an eight-year-old male and had some behavior problems. Uh, I think he may have been a little bit autistic or Asperger's and he was pretty active and had a single mother and <clears throat> uh, had some real discipline problems and was very, very active. And you can see it had a metaphyseal fracture six months prior. So he was placed in a long arm cast and we removed the cast uh, after the eight weeks and he refractured. So we went ahead and stabilized him with IM nails and that facial fracture went, went on to heal. Guess what happened next? You took 
Huh? Fractured again? Yeah, that's right. It fell off a swing or a bicycle and fractured again a third time. <clears throat> so what are you going to do? Well, you're just rebending. Refractures are usually, people get all worried about metabolic bone disease and so forth, but most of the studies that refractures are due to reckless behavior. And so simply what you do, you just bend the pins to reduce the fracture and hold him a little bit longer. And his behavior changed. He finally got the message and his fracture ceased. Should he replace the... Well, you, if there, you can try it first to see if you can do it. You probably, it would be maybe difficult to replace them because you got a lot of end osteocallus. And a lot of times you can just, when you manipulate it, you'll bend the pins. Now, the, 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 these are 0.62K wires, provide pretty good stability, but they're easily bent. Now, there's some thought that maybe the intermediary pins will stimulate good end osteocallus. So that may be an advantage of using those. So, final emphasis, how should most fractures of the radius and ulna fractures be treated? Unoperatively. Yeah, most forearm fractures, what did I say, forearm fractures? I'm sorry. Radius and ulna shaft fractures can be treated non-operatively. I misspoke, sorry. So, but there are some common complications. What are some of the complications? Loss of reduction. Refracture. And it's a little bit higher in the diaphysis. Malunion. Synostosis. Compartment syndrome. Nerve injuries or muscle entrapment. Now, what's the refracture rate for radius and ulna shaft fracture? Well, it's about almost a little over 10%. And you need to warn the patients ahead of time that when you take it out, even though the fracture looks healed, they're gonna to have to somewhat limit their activity or maybe protect them with some type of removable brace until they get their full motion back, full muscle strength back, because there's a, about 10% of these will refracture. So in this study, you know, distal radial metaphyseal fractures, it's very rare to see a refracture there, uh, less than 3%. When do refractures occur? Well, in this study here, they found that the refractures, the peak was at about 16 weeks. That's when they've gotten enough muscle strength and so forth, and they're back out playing full speed. So what fractures are felt to predispose to recurrent fractures? Well, take them, take it off, cast off too soon. Reckless behavior, residual deformities. If there are green stick fractures, remember you have incomplete callus in post plate or pin removal. And here is a good example. Here's one. We used to leave the pins out, and we take the pins out in the clinic, which was kind of a screaming fit when you take it out. And so they'd get a little bit, uh, the pins were left out, and so they'd get a little local irritation around there, and you take out the pins prematurely. And we took them out, pins removed, there was, the patient had no protection, but came back later and had a fracture, mainly because he had not had the mobilization long enough. Remember, diaphyseal bone is slower to heal. Residual deformity, we talked about this. If it's dorsally angulated, they have more of a tendency to get refracture. So, I've gone through all of these, the, the uh, radius and ulna fractures. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.